Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for staying longer uh, and accommodating the change. So um, I'm just giving you a little bit of the journey how uh, we get into the work. <clears throat> so I am Bay as a Royal Institution, um, and this is a very uh, old independent research laboratory, and it's nice that you got a 14, uh, 15 Nobel laureate and where they discover 10 elements. So I'll just give you some quick example of the people relating to part of my work. Is this like uh, Michael Faraday uh, with a magnetic nanoparticle and you do a lot with nanoparticle and when we do with the X-ray diffraction, then you will have a Henry Bragg uh, where they do the uh, X-ray and, and also like when you use in biology, physics, it's just a device, it's a device that you use for um, keeping something cold or hot for isolation. So uh, Michael Friday, uh, so in this talk, I'm talking about the magnetic nanoparticles. So here is a device, uh, it's in the museum that you can come and see uh, when we are opening up. So if you want to read more about nanoparticles, um, then you can got this um, issue, I edited it. And also you can look at the video uh, done by the Rowan Society um, talking about small, that mean nanoparticle here, and you can see those video. So also that um, there is much more detail because this talk is only 15 minutes, include questions. So if you want to know more, then if you Google my name and nanomaterials, then you can see the uh, lunch hour lecture with more detail. So in terms of magnetic nanoparticles, there are two books, I edited them. And so uh, one is earlier on um, where you capture this, uh, you know, different development um, for the fabrication uh, of the clinical application to all the way to clinical application. And six years later, this is more complementary uh, of the first book, so they are very interesting. Uh, and so I highly recommend them to uh, written through and thanks for the community uh, to uh, contribute a very comprehensive, high quality book chapters. So now I'm talking about magnetic uh, materials. So when you normally talk um, the things that people uh, need to talk about when you talk about magnetic material is MS, that is that saturation magnetization. So you have a very high MS uh, for pure iron or cobalt. But the thing that we often hear or see in the literature that is iron oxide because they are FDA approved. But you see that there is a significant decrease in the saturation magnetization. The reason for that is that because uh, iron got oxidized very easily. So they, when they got oxidized, they lost their saturation magnetization. And in terms of cobalt get even worse because here you're going to form the, something very uh, magnetic to antiferromagnetic of the cobalt oxide and you lost the magnetic property uh, altogether. And there are some other classes of materials that we are looking at as an alloy of cobalt iron or iron platinum. Um, that that's also have a high saturation magnetization. So that's here we're giving you example of um, the problem with oxidization. So here is the iron, uh, is like more like micron uh, uh, size. So when uh, you pour wow. into the it's very nice example there. Uh, when you pour into the air, they burst into the flames. So imagine that if you got nanoparticle of pure iron, you, you win really, you know, you, you, there is no, within a moment, you, you don't have any iron zero anymore, but you can have an oxide of the iron. Uh, so uh, in order to do something about it, so we need to coating them. So in this case, you use a uh, inert, uh, um, platinum. And I had to say that you when asked why not using gold, gold is very difficult to work with because the crystallatic mismatch uh, between the interface with the iron cobalt. If you remember the table, the iron cobalt has very high saturation magnetization. But after that, because for biomedical, uh, biomedical application, you need to functionalize them uh, with, uh, in this way here, it's a PMAO. Uh, polymer. 
So we also, uh, in terms of for biomedical application, you, you really want to have something that uh, very have a high efficacy. So that means you use less of them and they have the same effect. Um, so in this case, we try to make the pure iron and coating with iron oxide because as you see previously, it's impossible to make pure iron. So very interesting thing uh, we found out is that um, the shell of the iron oxide is thick and constant at four nanometers. So in terms of uh, getting higher magnetic moment, you would like to have a bigger core of iron. So you want to make this core is getting bigger. So here is a, a stem image that where you do elemental mapping. So red is oxygen and blue is iron and you can see that's really clearly core shell structure with a lot more oxygen outside and a lot more and inside because it's 3d mapping scanning through on the top so you could see that you can see some um you know mix uh, of the two elements but uh, you can see clearly that is a core shell structure so in terms of this kind of uh, particle, we got a very high saturation magnetization in this one here. You can see that's up to nearly 100, about 35 EMU per gram. So then we're testing that for magnetic hyperthermia for cancer treatment, and uh, so we're testing them with the ILP intrinsic loss parameter, and so to compare them with the different commercially available and nanoparticles and our nanoparticles. So we got higher saturation, sorry, higher LP. And uh, the interesting thing is that uh, they are very stable. So uh, you could have uh, this uh, iron oxide coating, make them stable up to uh, two months. And so another system we're looking at, um, and then yesterday we get to discuss about the uh, microfluidic or millifluidic flow uh, synthesis. And then with this system, we are able to make very high magnetic moment of iron carbide. And you can see that's the uh, structure of iron carbide here. Um, and then we also uh, have a, a, the red one is at 300K, that has the room temperature. And you can also see they have a, a quite high saturation magnetization and again that when we look at this table you I show you the example of uh, the iron system uh, with the coating of the iron oxide carbon platinum system the iron carbide but these materials will take a bit of time to get them approved but the iron oxide is already approved by the FDA despite they have a lower saturation magnetization. So that give you a little bit of uh, history about the synthesis of the iron oxide nanoparticle. So this is in 1852 and the paper was published uh, um, by um, Mr. Lefort and they say here that these um, these uh, oxide are black and they attract to the magnet, but no way that is the magnetic nano materials, right? So, so this is a work, the earliest one, and then in the early of the last century, you got ferromagnetic colloid, and this used by the physicists, and then. Until the 81, then the real preparation of the nanoparticle, of the iron oxide nanoparticle used by René Massas. And then this is our work in uh, 2012. We look at the uh, uh, morphological and structural evolution of iron oxide nanoparticle. But in this way, we're not using sodium hydroxide, but using sodium carbonate. Uh, that is a mild reductant, so we slow the reaction and seeing the different phases of nano uh, particle. And interestingly, that again we're talking back back about the microfluidic yesterday and millifluidic here. So with this reactor, it allow us um, uh, to see the very early on of the reaction. So we could take the sample out and go through the X-ray and see. Um, the evolution um, of the different uh, intermediate. So what interesting thing that you can see here is that, you know, different color, different shape as different phase of iron oxide or uh, not 
necessarily outside, but different size of, of the iron uh, composites, right, or a compound. So you can have a hydroxide, you have a carbonate, and you have a mixture of different things. But the only magnetite or machimite that giving you the highly magnetic with a high saturation magnetization. So what you need to do is that you need to minimize the concentration of the intermediate. So by the minimize the concentration of the intermediate, you need to know when they are forming and um, how you're going to control uh, the formation. So we look at the TM at a different time frame here on the way from 30 seconds to 10 minutes. You look at the particle size, and here you can also look at the number of the particle here, uh, evolution with time. And you got look at the electron diffraction here. And then you can start seeing that the peak, the peak you can see here. So about two minutes, the peak are still forming. So that means when the reaction, if you're doing anything above three minutes, game is over. So you really need to control the reaction that so that when any intermediate or phase is very early on of the process. So I think it's very crucial because uh, in the literature, there are thousands of paper on the anoxide. You reported different saturation magnetization. They reported different psi value and p value. And because the synthesis was not controlled. So it's very important. I think Ivana said yesterday, it's very important that characterization, you need to characterize what you got, right? So you need to first to make sure that the process you're making is monodispersed particle and then you correct them well. So on the, on, the, on the other work that we also using microfluidic, look at the co-precipitation co of the ion oxide using with sodium hydroxide. And then, uh, Again, with the uh, uh, flow system, but we're using the high temperature. So this one, the temperature up uh, and above 250 degree uh, C. So then it's a high temperature. You can see that we can make very small uh, nanoparticle. It's a very interesting thing about the small uh, nanoparticle. So I talk about here uh, a lot about the core. Uh, with a different chemical composition, how you're making them. But uh, we also need to look at the stability of the nanoparticles, so the shell has to be important. So you can have a, a different bio, biological molecule like peptide, or you can use a polymer, or you can use a inorganic silica go, and they have a different functional group, like carboxylic or amine, so that you can have a, a later on that's a case of um, interaction right so you can have like uh, antibody antigen interaction dna dna interaction biotin stratabidine interaction so you need to to have a, uh, the system that designed for intended application so come back to uh, you know the title of the talk that so how are we going to use this nanoparticle for hypothermia cancer treatment? So one of them is one of the ligand here. We use a thermal responsive polymer. So what's the nice thing about thermal responsive polymer is that they respond to the temperature. So we can use that to synthesize the nanoparticle at high uh, hot organic solvent. It makes them very crystalline. You cool them down at the room temperature, remove organic, organic solvent, and then put the water and it's re it pours into uh, the water. So it's a one uh, step process. And so here coming back to the, uh, the main objective of what we try to do. So we make the nanoparticle here and we coating them with a polymer, right? So uh, coating the term polymer and then use the magnetic um, hypothermia. So here's the, the contract of the, uh, of the nanoparticle is that we have a polymer and then we also loading them with the so rubicin and then we do the release profile. So as a, a neutral PS, um, they are not um, very responsive for um, the uh, for, for for the release because uh, they are 
got a um, bone that would be breaking out as a um, cancer environment as the pH um, lower the so acidic so at a 5.7 or higher temperature because of alternating magnetic field making the magnetic nanoparticle heat up you can have a high release and the other one you have a lower release so we also look uh, into that uh, when you talk about nanoparticles, they're not only nanoparticles, they will be clustered them in the different cluster. So it depends on different contract of the different cluster, you have a different heating uh, property. In this way, you have an INP intrinsic loss parameter with these contracts, you have a higher heating with this contract, and then we could go up to 4.1 uh, INP, which is quite high. Then we look at them. Uh, there is a system here that got pancake coil, and then you can look into the microscope, and then you can look uh, at how the cell uh, are dying in the alternating magnetic field. And the result, what we are showing here, that uh, here from the time zero to on the way to the time of 23 hour, and what's the observation from this experiment telling us is that uh, they don't die at the same time, but they are very much like cell specific. So that means it depends on the on the loading of the nanoparticle of the different cells, and then they will die at a different time. And what does it mean is that uh, you often think that when you got magnetic hyperthermia, you're going to heat up the whole environment of the solution, and then you kill all of them at once. No, because you know, it depends on uh, on the different cells. Some cells will be heated up higher and they will be dying first. So that saying that you're going to have a cellular level of killing uh, of the magnetic hyperthermia. So that's really important. And also that you don't need to rig a very high temperature because you just rig enough high temperature enough to affect that individual cells and that also cause the effect. And so here's a more recent uh, publication we have on this one. Again, we got the polymer, we got doxorubicin, and we are loading with a cell, and there are two different things here. When you had get the nanoparticle get inside the cell, and you get the nanoparticle outside the cell, and the experiment telling you that you don't need to get the nanoparticle inside the cell, they can stay outside a cell, and they also can kill. And then also you don't need very high, only 40 degree, you can so start seeing the effect. So here it was so the data of some survivability of the internalized nanoparticle, and we look at the control, um, it's the same thing I can see. You can have a control, you got the magnetic nanoparticle alone, and you got magnetic nanoparticle with doxorubicin, and obviously the synergistic effect of doxorubicin and also the magnetic nanoparticle, and you can see that cell viability, viability going really down here, uh, up to the gap like 20% compared to here when there is nothing with no magnetic field, then you can see that obviously there is no affecting. So we can say that there is a synergistic effect between the doxal ruby seen, so that means chemotherapy, and the magnetic hyperthermia. That is a conclusion. Another thing that um, is very interesting, the previous talk, when you're talking about the uh, near infrared. So we wrote this review to look into the two modality. One the magnetic, another one is photo-induced magnetic hyperthermia. So a very interesting read for you. And then also I was privileged to get this uh, prize, uh, Rosalind Franklin you know Award, very prestigious from the Royal Society, National Academy of Science in UK. And this is a public lecture, so you can go and see more. And with that, I would like to acknowledge my collaborator. It's very international effort and very interdisciplinary work. And would like to thank all the funder. And uh, I would like to say that I'm editing editor-in-chief of the nanoscience and nanotechnology series. So if any of you interested in adding a book, uh, please contacting me. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And I'm very happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your excellent overview. Uh, now we have time for questions. So questions, please. Uh, yes, Ivana, please. 
Yes, I uh, thank you, uh, Tan, for this uh, for this talk. Uh, it's pity that that we didn't hear it yesterday, because yesterday there were like almost double uh, attendees than today. <laughs> but okay, a I bit like people can. Talk. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I have a question. Uh, perhaps I missed it uh, somewhere in your presentation, but. Uh, when you compared the, the magnetic nanoparticles and, uh, without and with uh, doxorubicin, did you also include uh, the doxorubicin treatment uh, as additional control oh, to yeah. compare uh, the you know the, the effect of uh, doxorubicin itself and doxorubicin loaded on uh, magnetic nanoparticles? Uh, doxorubicin uh, on its own is very very toxic. Um, it is very highly toxic. So uh, we look into, um, I think if if I can go back to the data, so uh, uh, so this one here, so you, you will have uh, just no, no alternating magnetic field and then we raise to 40 and 20 degree and then you got the control where you got nanoparticle and also uh, Dr. BC alone, I think uh, that is one comment of the reviewer and we respond that because Dr. Dr. BC alone it is very toxic. Uh, so so because we want to compare of Dr. BC here in, in conjugated with a nanoparticle at a system. So we didn't want to, to compare directly with Dr. BC in that way because Yes, I see what you are saying, but we already anticipated that, that they are much, much more toxic if the doctor is seen alone. Uh, so that's why. Yes, uh, well, I, I know that because I work a lot with doxorubicin as well, uh, but with different type of nanoparticles. But uh, uh, so it would so so the, the uh, I guess that the main idea of your work is to um, uh, to uh, uh, increase uh, or to, to enhance uh, pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic properties of doxorubicin to, to, uh, to decrease the dose needed to, to kill the, the tumor cells, while um, uh, this will, would be then um, more safer for healthy cells. Am I right? Yeah, we, we want to have a control release. Uh, the control release because we control by using the alternating magnetic field. So that means doxorubicin only release when it's heating up. So that means uh, we can control the time and the duration of the release. And then we control release that uh, only when the nanoparticle get inside the cell because it's more acidic. So that will be it, it will be more a release uh, when they got inside uh, the cell. And because the cancer cell are more acidic, so that will be more release. Uh, so if if we go into just to get the doxorubicin alone. Uh, then that's that's obviously as you you already studied right so that that's, that's a different thing so the the aim we want here is that to conjugate the doxorubicin with a magnetic nanoparticle and have a control release and then we have a two me mechanism of control heat and also pH. And did you perhaps check the what what. Um, happen uh, uh, with uh, reticular and endothelium system? Uh, what is the interaction uh, between um, RES and uh, your magnetic nanoparticles? So, so what would be the administra uh, route of administration of such nanoparticles? I think I think there is a big consensus now in terms of the magnetic uh, hyperthermia in the community. We all agree now is that the mode of administration is a direct injection into the tumor, because if you don't, then they will go into the deep inside like a liver, and then and also the spleen. So there is no specific uh, to the target. Uh, so the um, um the using for glioblastoma, the inject directly into the tumor. So the mode of, uh, of administration at the moment is that, you know, uh, tumoral injection. 
So you think it's also possible for breast cancer because it's uh, doxorubicin is uh, yes, also yes. recommended therapy for yes. breast cancer? Of course, of course you can you can so so you can you know people talking about the prostate as well and the breast. Uh, um, people look into head and neck as well. So uh, yes, so so because the magnetic field is very um, uh, penetrable, that means the field can go through your body. Um, so as long as you can really deliver your nanoparticle to the size, like the tumor size, then you can work with that. So yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.